Welcome to MindShift. I'm Brandon. Today is another Sunday episode in which we are looking at God and his emotions. Now, most believers would not take any issue with the fact that this God is emotional. After all, supposedly God is love. However, these two videos might convince you otherwise, but I want to focus today on more of the negative emotions that this God displays. Even the positive ones become problematic when we consider that this God is supposed to be omniscient and all-powerful. So I'm going to bring up seven reasons why I think it's problematic that this God is so very highly emotional, and then we are going to do a deep dive, as always, into many verses to back this case up. And stick with me through the verses as well. I think you'll be surprised by quite a few of them. Let's go ahead and dive into these seven issues here. I'm going to be really brief with them because I think we'll explain them much more as we get into the verses themselves. Issue number one is the contradictions with omniscience. If this God is truly omniscient, meaning that he has the foreknowledge of everything that will ever happen, each decision and action that every part of his creation will ever do for all time, why does he get surprised or disappointed or hurt? That is a very human-like emotion in real time to an event where someone was not expecting something. Second is the contradiction with omnipotence. If God is truly all-powerful, his very human-like reactions to what us lowly humans are doing down here suggests the fact that he is potentially out of control or not able to achieve what he wills. You can give excuses here of free will in general, but you'll see as we get into some of the verses that this really does just fall short. Issue three is the anthropomorphism of God or the reliability of his revelation. To me, these human-like emotions seem to suggest more that we made God like us and not that some God who is perfect and wouldn't have half of these emotions, if any at all, would have made us in his image. There is a dire contradiction here. And the second part of this issue is the reliability of revelation, this idea that the word of God is his revelation to mankind, whether it is written himself through his spirit, inspired and handed down through men who are indeed fallible. Whatever interpretation you take of how we got the Holy Bible, if it describes God in such human-like fashions with all of these whims and inconsistencies, I think it would call into question the validity of the text itself or of the God that it is describing. The fourth one, and kind of similar, is this inconsistency in divine nature. When we think of these human emotions, they are typically caused because of a lack of something, driven by limitations. We have desires, we have vulnerabilities, we do not, again, have this foreknowledge. But not so much talking about God's omniscience, but more God's perfection. If God is perfect and thus lacks these human limitations, then finding him with these kinds of emotions is very contradictory. What perfect God is petty or jealous or sad. That's not perfection. Our fifth one should be obvious, but it would be issues with morality, specifically that of God's morality, who is supposed to be the creator and arbiter of all objective morals. See this video if you want to see something similar where we go through a ton of verses to dismiss this notion. But if it is God's emotions that lead to his decisions, which we will see of anger and wrath and vengeance, how set in stone are they? They seem to be swinging on a pendulum, just like human emotions, which are supposed to be so very fallible and weak. If we're consistent with the logic here, I think we should see major issues with the concept of a perfect being, moral speaking, and the fact that he has these emotions that he is working out of. Six is kind of a strange one, and I've struggled with how to put it together here, but I think it has something to do with human agency. If we have a God that is emotional and that reacts and acts in the world and towards us based off of our own emotions, I think it brings up issues with free will, with our autonomy, with our agency. If we have a supernatural being that knows and sees everything that we do and then acts out of an emotional response toward us. How free are we if there are going to be these kinds of consequences? These are not natural consequences. By definition, if you are placing God in the supernatural category, but then giving him emotions that cause him to act out in the world in response to us, that seems highly problematic to me. And then lastly, and similar to number six, 
is the psychological impact on believers. Again, going off what I said just before, if this God is so reactive, if these believers believe themselves to be under this constant form of scrutiny, it often leads to horrendous psychological effects of fear and guilt and shame and inadequacy. As opposed to, if we just had a consistent God who was very clear in who he was and what his nature was, and really did give us the short time frame here on earth to live our lives and either prosper or not based off the natural consequences of the order that was initially set up instead of again him reacting emotionally this one might be avoidable but it's not so those are my seven issues and i think we're going to see them play out in different ways as we go through i think i have a list of 10 different emotions from god now the 10 that i'm going to share are inherently negative emotions. I don't want to skip over the fact, though, that God definitely has positive emotions. Described in this Bible, we have a God that does love, that does forgive, that does show mercy, and that can be compassionate. The problem is, and not always, but often described right along with those positive emotions are conditions, which makes sense when you consider that these are indeed emotions and emotions are going to fluctuate. But again, for a consistent God, if we really want to call him these things, merciful, compassionate, loving, forgiving, I think we have some issues. So I wanted to share a few quick verses that just show those conditions. Let's do Psalm 103.13. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. Conditional, off a very negative experience as well. Exodus 34, 6 through 7, the Lord, O God, merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abundant in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generations. By the way, I could have given one of a hundred verses here to show that God's mercy is A, not for everyone, B, conditional, and C, unfair. Punishing the children for the sins of the father is anything but merciful. And it's all said here in the same breath. Yet most Christians will pick out the first part, all of those things that sounded so lovely, and ignore the second part. I'm here to always bring the second part. One last example here for forgiving, and then we'll get into the negative emotions. Matthew 6, 14 through 15, for if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your father will not forgive your sins. Conditional. And some of you will have no problem with that. Yep, God has deals. He has rules. You have to do X to get Y. Okay, makes sense if you're a human, makes sense if you're not perfect, makes sense if you don't call yourself the very definition of love, makes sense if it's not your fault that this entire thing is in play. None of us chose to be here. None of us asked Adam and Eve to eat the fruit from the garden. None of us told Satan to rebel, fall from heaven, get dominion over the earth and tempt us eternally. Like, it is absolutely insane that people are indeed okay with this. But... Let's move on to the third and final part of the video where we go through all of the verses. Again, I have this broken down into, I believe, 10 categories of emotions. Some of them are grouped together. Today, I'm doing only Old Testament verses. There were so many for both old and new that I thought we would extend this and have yet another episode to cover the New Testament or the emotions of Jesus versus what we're covering today, the emotions of the God of the Old Testament or Yahweh. Now, a good believer should believe they are one in the same. So no excuses today of, well, that's all Old Testament. Look at Jesus with his love and mercy. No, this is the same God. Jesus claims as much over and over and over. He is here to fulfill the prophets. He is here to uphold the law. If you know him, you know the Father. No excuses for the Old Testament. Also, this God is immutable. He does not change. You don't get to make these kinds of claims. The last thing that I want to say, and then we'll get into the verses, is that I was really careful. I looked at the full context of these verses to make sure I wasn't missing anything. I made sure that it was God speaking about himself or a prophet directly saying what God told them to say. So this isn't just David in the field saying something about how God is like X. Even though we should be able to consider that scripture and believe it about God if we believe the Bible and its claims, I am only dealing with direct claims that God wanted to have said about himself. These are not my words. These are his. Is. You're not arguing with me, you're arguing with him. So let's get started. Emotion number one is 
surprise or displeased. I put these together and I've got a few examples. Isaiah 59, 15 through 16, the Lord looked and was displeased that there was no justice. He saw that there was no one. He was appalled that there was no one to intervene. So his own arm achieved salvation for him and his own righteousness sustained him. Now, I wanted to start with this verse because it brings up a bunch of the issues and the excuses that the believer will often make. We have so many times in the Bible where God acts like he doesn't know what's going on, or he sends someone to investigate, or he has to ask Satan what was happening down there. And many times in context, it is like if I were talking to a child and I already knew the answer, but I wanted them to arrive at that conclusion themselves. I might say, well, what happened? Even though I already heard the argument between my son and my daughter, I want them to tell me. I want them to process it. So I'm aware of this, and I didn't use most of the examples that have this kind of a language. I'm wanting to be as fair as possible so the ones I do bring up really stand on their own. But this one, we see right away, the Lord looked, so this is his doing. He sees, and he's displeased. Is this catching him off guard? He saw that there was no one, and he was appalled. Again, this level of surprise makes no sense with an omniscient being, and I'm not going to explain every verse. My main job today is to present them to you and let you figure out for yourself why they're problematic, but I will make a few points as we go through some of these. Next, we have Jeremiah 19.5. They have built the high places of Baal to burn their children in the fire as offerings to Paul, something I did not command or mention, nor did it enter my mind. There's no excuse for that one. God himself is truly surprised and aghast, and it did not even cross his mind. That's not possible if you're omniscient. And the last one I have for surprise or displeased is Jeremiah 3, 6 through 7. The Lord said to me in the days of King Josiah, have you seen what she did, the faithless one, Israel, how she went up on every hill and there played the whore? And I thought, after she has done all this, she will return to me. But she did not return and her treacherous sister Judah saw it. Is this God being wrong. He is surprised that Israel, who he has personified into the harlot or the whore here, did not turn from her ways as he expected her to do. Hopefully you're getting a feel for what we're doing here. So that was the first one, surprised and displeased. Let's get into insecure. I have just three verses for you here. Numbers 14, 11, And the Lord said to Moses, How long will the people despise me? And how long will they not believe in me in spite of all the signs that I have done among them? A little insecure, I think. How about Genesis 11, 5 through 6? But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower the people were building. The Lord said, If as one people speak in the same language, they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Now, even if you believe the story of Babel is metaphorical, metaphor of what? God is threatened here by man's capabilities. And it's hilarious because since the Tower of Babel, which was if it even existed at all or was based off some story, even metaphorically, was some very small ziggurat, nothing in impressive, nothing compared to the pyramids that would come or the skyscrapers. Is God not afraid now? Should he not disperse us again? The inconsistencies are truly astounding. My last example for insecure comes from Dute 32, 26. I said I would scatter them and erase their name from human memory, but I dreaded the taunt of the enemy, lest the adversary misunderstand and say, our hand has triumphed. The Lord has not done all this. God is afraid of how someone might misinterpret him, specifically his enemies, which is also something we don't talk about enough, God has enemies and not because of what they've done. All of God's enemies, by the way, did the exact same thing that his people did. So what's the difference? One's a chosen people and one is his enemy set out from the beginning. But moving on, let's get to impulsive. Exodus 32 10. Now, therefore, let me alone that my wrath may burn hot against them and I may consume them in order that I may make a great nation of you. So again, the full context here, something happens and God just immediately says, hey, leave me alone. Time for me to do my thing. Wrath, destruction, vengeance. Also, I love that he uses the word that I may consume them, considering yesterday's. If you didn't see yesterday's video, please go and watch it. It is me doing a review of the DC Talk song, Consume Me, which is why I bring this up. And it's a series I really want to start doing. And I think that we can get a lot out of that. Our next example of impulsive, number 16, 20 through 21. And the Lord spoke to Moses and to Aaron saying, separate yourselves from among this congregation that I may 
consume them in a moment. So this happens very quick. God gets pissed and he's like, step aside, boys, here I go again. And lastly, in 2 Samuel 6, 6 through 7, Uzzah put his hand on the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen stumbled. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God struck him down there because of his error. And he died there beside the ark of God. Now, not only is this hands down the most unfair and ridiculous thing, because he didn't do it on purpose. He wasn't trying to steal God's glory. Later, by the way, we have an entire army stealing the ark. How did they do that without touching it? And God doesn't destroy that army, but one of God's own people tries to catch it from falling, which is to show it honor, and he dies. I'm sorry, he gets murdered by God impulsive. Now, all of these also could have worked for anger and jealousy, which are coming up next. So let's go through a few verses for anger and jealousy. First, Numbers 11, 1. And the people complained in the hearing of the Lord about their misfortune. And when the Lord heard it, his anger was kindled, and the fire of the Lord burned against them, and he consumed some of the outlying part of the camp. This God's anger sure gets kindled a lot. Hearing us grumble and complain a little bit, what did he expect? Do 32, 9. 19 through 20. By the way, this chapter 32 has so many horrendous emotions from God. I'd encourage you to go read the whole thing. I think we're going to use it for three different ones. Here we see the Lord saw this and rejected them because he was angered by his sons and daughters. So not only an admission of anger, but rejection. That is pure and simple, an emotional reaction. Ezekiel 5.13, thus shall my anger spend itself, and I will vent my fury upon them and satisfy myself, and they shall know that I am the Lord, that I speak in my jealousy when I spend my fury upon them. So we have a lot here. We have both anger and jealousy in an attempt to do what? To satisfy himself. This again is part of the seven issues that I have, a God that is not truly perfect. Perfect beings don't exist in a state of unsatisfaction, thus needing to be satisfied, yet alone by such horrendous and petty and small anger and jealousy. Yuck! Human to a core not divine. Nahum 1, 2 through 3. The Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on his adversaries and keeps wrath for his enemies. And lastly, Exodus 25, just to beat the dead horse, you shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Once again, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generations of those who hate me. My name is Jealousy. Therefore, or I've given myself the right to satisfy myself of cursing not only the generation that didn't like me, but their innocent children and children's children and on. This does not get any more clear. Similar to anger and jealousy, but a little different, is God's capability of being petty, his pettiness. Let's do three examples really quick. Again, from Duke 32, 20, I will hide my face from them, he said, and see what their end will be. It's so snarky. I'm going to hide from them. We'll see how they do then. Ugh, gross. Psalm 2, 4, he who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. I get this quoted at me all the time, that God is laughing at my attempts of bringing him down. I don't believe in God. I'm using a hypothetical framework that this God does exist to show how inconsistent, improbable, and actually just truly unreconcilable he would be if he somehow could exist, which he can't. They're all mutually exclusive claims. That's what I'm pointing out here. But a God who just sits in heaven laughing, that's not compassionate. That's not a desire for everyone to be saved. Honestly, I I know that maybe I'm coming off a hair more sarcastic than usual. It's just because of the ridiculousness of these verses. But I implore the believer, really consider what this God says about himself and check that against the idealized version of God that you pray to and worship in your quiet time. It's not the same. 2 Kings 2, 23 through 24. From there, Elisha went up to Bethel and he was walking and along the road, some boys came out of the town and jeered at him. Get out of here, Baldy, they said. He turned around, looked at them, and called down a curse on them in the name of the Lord. The two bears came out of the woods and mauled 42 of the boys. You guys have all heard this story. It's absolutely ridiculous. I understand that this is a prophet doing it. It's also one of God's best prophets, and also it's in the name of the Lord. This did not get away from God. God accepted this. God thought this was right. Is there anything more petty in this entire Bible than a god and his prophet killing 42 innocent 
children for a light case of mockery. Let's move on. How about hateful? So much represents God's hatefulness, but I'll just do a few here. Isaiah 1, 14. Your new moon feast and your appointed festivals I hate with all my being. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. More than hateful, even though that word is used here, the two words that strike me the most are God who becomes weary, which is actually our next category, and that he's just tired of bearing them. He's tired. He had to bear them. These are not attributes of a God. Come on. How about Hosea 9.15? All their wickedness is in Gagal, for there I hated them because of their wickedness of their deeds. I will drive them out from my house. I will no longer love them. Malachi 1.3. But Esau I have hated, and I have turned his hill country into a wasteland and left his inheritance to the desert jackals. Oh, that sweet love of God. Okay, let's go to being weary or impatient. I've got a few here for you. Jeremiah 15.6. You have rejected me, declare is the Lord. You keep on backsliding, so I will reach out and destroy you. I am weary of holding back. Would a God who's perfect and all-powerful ever just, ugh, I'm ugh, I'm tired of it. I don't want to hold back anymore. Here's my vengeance. Maybe we just have really different ideas about what this God is supposed to be like. Isaiah 43, 24. You have not bought any fragrant calamus for me or lavished on me the fat of your sacrifices, but you have burdened me with your sins and wearied me with your offenses. Okay. Malachi 2, 17. You have wearied the Lord with your words. How have you wearied him, you ask? By saying, all who do evil are good in the eyes of the Lord, and he is pleased with them. Or where is this God of justice? Sounds like we can really get under God's skin. How very human-like. What about a God that is unforgiving? We shouldn't have too many examples of that. Psalm 95, 10. For 40 years, I was angry with that generation. I said, they are a people whose hearts go astray and they have not known my way. So I declared an oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. God got himself so worked up, he made a promise to himself to not forgive these people. Unbelievable. Jeremiah 5, 7 through 9. Why should I forgive you? I also just love that he's asking here, which again could be in that kind of a parent to a child way. Your children have forsaken me and sworn by gods that are not gods. I supplied all their needs, yet they committed adultery and thronged in the houses of prostitutes. They are well-fed, lusty stallions, each name for another man's wife. So this is God not saying he won't forgive, but why should I? Maybe we should have put this with Petty. Isaiah 9, 17. Therefore the Lord will take no pleasure in the young men, nor will he pity the fatherless and the widows, for every one is ungodly and wicked. Every mouth speaks folly, yet for all this his anger is not turned away. His hand is still up raised. And I have plenty more. I've, I had plenty more for all of these, but I think we'll move on to we have two left, indecisive and regretful. Here's indecisive. Amos 7.3, the Lord relented concerning this. It will not happen, the Lord said. Now, some of these are actually good. God is not pouring out the wrath that a few moments ago when he was so angered and riled up and making oaths to himself about, you know, that kind of a thing. Oh, he actually didn't go through with it. So some people would call that mercy. I would call it a lie and I would call it inconsistent. And indecisive. If you have foreknowledge, how do you say you're going to do something you know you won't do? What is the benefit of that? A couple more for this one. Exodus 32, 14. Then the Lord relented and did not bring on his people the disaster that he had threatened. Same thing. How about Jeremiah 31, 20? Is not Ephraim my dear son, the child in whom I delight? Though I often speak against him, I still remember him. Therefore, my heart yearns for him. I have great compassion for him, declares the Lord. Again, a very pretty verse here, but how human-like. This is just a God who, I want to be mad, but I just can't. Okay. And the last verse for indecisive is Isaiah 63, 10. But they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. Therefore, he turned to be their enemy and himself fought against them. So again, we could have put this with anger or so many of the other ones, but we have an example of God feeling one way. And then after an action from a human that he already would have known was coming, he changed his mind. He had an emotional reaction and then acted out of that. Problematic to say the least. And then I've got just two verses left, and these will be for regret. First Samuel 4. 15, 10 through 11, the word of the Lord came to Samuel. I regret that I have made Saul king. 
for he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. Did God not know what would happen when he anointed Saul? What we have of God turning away from Saul, being disappointed, being surprised, regretting this as if he had no idea. Meanwhile, we also see that God had been planning and had always anointed David to be king. So he had some foreknowledge to know that he would need David as a backup, but not enough foreknowledge to know he should have never dealt with Saul in the first place. The more you look into this entire scenario, the more and more messy it gets. And then I think maybe one of the worst verses in the entire Bible is the one I saved for last under regret. And it's right away in the Bible, Genesis 6, 6 through 7. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him to his heart. Then don't. Honestly, this is clearly a man-made story. He regretted that he made man and it grieved him to his heart. This is obviously as it pertains to when God killed the entire world except for one family. So out of his regret, which he could have avoided with his foreknowledge, he genocides. Really imagine the babies drowning. The three-year-olds in sheer panic as their parents hold them up high, watching them die, and then going down to die themselves. The new lovers holding each other as they grasp and end up fighting over the last scrap of dry land before the waves overtake. The suffering and chaos that ensued from this one event alone because of God's regret over what he made, which also seems to me to be a portion of him taking responsibility responsibility for the fact it didn't work out is one of the sickest things in the entire Bible. God could have chosen not to make us. He could have made us in a way where this wouldn't happen, and he rejected both of those options. Evil. And not only that, but he does it again by saving one family and allowing it to start all over. If we believe this narrative that this is where all people came from, then we've had maybe 15 billion people that have gone through a life of suffering with, again, if the way is truly narrow, whatever percentage you like, maybe 10 to 14 billion of those people burning in hell forever, completely avoidable. God could have just never done it. If it really got away from him, he could have ended it once and not let it start again. This is a God who continues to make bad decisions, either with the knowledge that they are bad, which makes him bad, or because he doesn't know, which makes him not all-powerful, not omniscient. There's no getting away from any of this. It's horrendous. We're going to probably take a whole nother hour and another time to talk about this particular verse and what it really means and all the different ways that it trickles down to the horror of this God claim. But that is it for today. I hope that this was, I don't know, I don't even want to say the word interesting. It really is just so sad to see how lowly this God that so many believe to be so superior is. This is a weak God. This is a God who is surprised, who doesn't know what's going on, who's in impulsive, who's wrathful, who's hateful, who's unforgiving, who's indecisive and disgusted and everything else that makes him no better than any of us. And I would argue we have all surpassed this character. And that is all that he is. He is a character of fiction and maybe yet the worst one. So I do appreciate you being here. My goal for this is to help the doubter, the deconverter, the deconstructing to really get some ammo for their own mind to see this God that they're trying to cling on to is not worth it. Not only is he not worth it, he's not real. Let's use his own supposed words to shine the light on the ridiculousness of this fairy tale. No philosophy here, no Kalam arguments. This is 100% the Bible refuting itself. Thanks for watching. Have a wonderful day. I'll see you on Tuesday with another takedown. And until then, keep thinking. I wanted to personally thank my top tiers of support, my iconoclast and GVI, Jacob, Joe, Martin, Oliver, Perry, Rocket, and Sean, my humanist heroes, Jared and Christy, my atheist advocates, Caleb, Sparky, Stephanie, and Todd, as well as all of my secular scholar patrons. If you believe in the mission of this channel or you simply enjoy its content, please consider joining these fine people. Thanks and have a great day.